There's some talented people around here. Man, oh man. Hey, for those of you who are visiting with us this morning, uh, or you were missing last week, um, and right now, obviously, there's uh, quite a few gone for out hunting, you know, chasing around the woods, and we ask for safety and protection for them. <coughs> Excuse me. But we started a new series on stewardship. And so this has been fun so far. <laughs> Woo! You're not sure. No, I've, I've heard a lot of uh, positive comments. I know that whenever you, you talk about finances and that kind of stuff, people get a little, a little jittery, a little antsy. Um, again, relax. We've already taken the offering. We're not taking another one. So we're good. Okay? So just relax. Um, we started with looking at the Lord's Prayer last week, opened up with basically talking about uh, Jesus not wasting his breath. You know, if you think about it, another way of saying what I tried to say last week was this. If Jesus came to this earth and all of his teaching was summarized by the, our Father, by the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer, and left, we could have delved into that thing and understood all kinds of teachings and lifestyle, how to live as a Christian life. Because everything else he talked about that, beyond that, and taught, fit into some major category in the Lord's Prayer. Okay? Our Father. We have a Father who art in heaven. He's sovereign. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. So every time Jesus was expounding and talking about his Father, he would all fit under that umbrella of that first line of the Our Father. Last week, I laid a foundation for this, looking at, for us to really understand that Jesus, God, understands our practical needs. Because as he went through the line, the, the three major subjects, but the, the, the next major subject, after all this attention on God, our Father, and his will being done, the next thing he prays is, give us today our daily bread. He understands that we need to be concerned about that. And we need to look to Him for it. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Everything would fit under that category. Jesus is concerned with the practical, worldly, daily needs of life. Your home, your food, your clothes, your relatives, your recreation. All of that, God is concerned about. The Bible is not just a book that teaches us spiritual truths. It's a book that teaches us all kinds of truth on every subject, in every aspect of our life. We don't go to it just for spiritual things. We go to it for relationship ideas, for how to behave at work, for how to handle, again, our, our money, how, how to invest. It, it's all in the book. Isn't that cool? Stewardship. Money, possessions. We left off last week uh, looking at uh, Matthew chapter 13, Jesus told this lengthy parable about the seed, the word of God going into people's hearts. He describes some people, they're as hard as a path. The word of God comes and it just doesn't seem to penetrate. Other seed, the word of God hits some people's hearts and lives and it's like rocky soil. They receive it with joy, but as soon as a little bit of tough times come, it withers away. It doesn't really take root. And then he described what is, I think, probably a little bit larger section. The Word of God comes into people's lives. They begin growing. They begin doing well. But then all of a sudden, in verse 22, he says, The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the Word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the Word, making it I don't know about you, but I read that and I think that, is, that just sounds tragic. The worries of this life. You know, so many of us, we're worried about things that we have no business being worried about. I mean, I'm really worried about what Britney Spears is going to do later this afternoon. I'm really worried about who is, is Angelina Jolie going to get involved in politics. I'm really worried. Well, I'm a little worried about that. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, we, it, we occupy our time and energy so many times on stuff that, friends, it, it should not even occupy our time and our thoughts. 
or worries of this life. And the deceitfulness of wealth. Jesus uses an incredible adjective there. The deceitfulness of wealth. When somebody deceives you, it means they tricked you. You were deceived. You were tricked. It promised one thing, but it didn't deliver what it promised. See, we trust money to do things that it was never meant to do, like provide security. Friends, your only security is in Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Um, so last week we left off, I told you that this morning we're going to start with looking at the dangers of riches. And because Jesus really emphasized it in that term, terminology, the danger. It's, there's a lot of danger involved with it. Um, so in a sense, if you only have a little bit, you only have a little bit of danger in your life. If you have a lot of it, you have a lot of danger in your life. Now, I'm being rather facetious and funny, but it does fit. To whom much is given, much is required. Not just in the areas of finances, in the area in the areas of your, your mental capacity, your physical capacity, your gifts, your abilities, the things that you do. These weren't just for you. They serve a purpose in serving God in the kingdom. Amen? So I want to do this morning, a little bit different than my normal style, I would usually like to start out with a proposition and give you, there's three reasons why, or there's four reasons why. We're going to be just looking at, and open up the Word of God, looking at several scriptures that are addressing the subject of the dangers of riches. The first being Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 34. Again, rather lengthy passage. Notice as you turn there, because up here we don't see it in red letters, but this is Jesus teaching. And again, Jesus did not waste his time while he was on this earth. He talked about our life issues. Important stuff. We begin... Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. Well, you know, can I just pause here? Can I just tell you, there is one whole area of scripture that I'm totally ignorant. I have absolutely no idea what that scripture means. Can I just tell you that? I, I don't have a clue. By the way, do you like the lighting in here? Is it okay? This is kind of nice. I just went from that bright spotlight and out on here and I'm going, God, it's dark down here. But it's, once the eyes get used to it, it's not too bad. Jesus said, don't store up treasures on earth, but store up treasures in heaven. I do not have a clue what that means. I, I'm being really honest. This is not, I'm not trying to make another point and trying to trick you. But it makes me go, hmm. Jesus said, store up treasures in heaven. He never said necessarily what they're going to be used for. Why do you need them? Why did he tell us to do that? Man, I don't know. Are we going to need treasures up there to go down to the five and dime and Get a candy bar? I doubt it. I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, honestly, I've read that scripture so many times, I keep thinking. I do know that scripture teaches, we woven all throughout the teachings, this idea that what you do for the Lord, what you do in service to the king, to the kingdom, what you do in service to your fellow man, are ways you store up treasures in heaven. That's how you do it. You give, you serve, um, but what it's used for, I don't know. I do know and have a strong suspicion of this, though. If Jesus said you ought to do it, you ought to do it. If you don't take his, his exhortation, his heeding, you're going to get up there and be broke. And again... I don't know why or what for, but I really think that you and I ought to be more worried about our heavenly 401k 
401k. I got to think of a unique word to come up with that. Heaven, uh, your heavenly K. I don't know. John, come on, help me out here. You don't got nothing either. Come on, you know. It's, I was going to say, you deal with money all the time. No, you don't. You deal with numbers related to money. Um, Exactly right. It's what we do to, to serve God. But what we are going to do with the treasures in heaven, um, I don't know. But I have a question for you just to contemplate. Where is there more treasure? When you meet and sit down with your accountant, does he say, hey, does he check out and ask you, hey, how's your heavenly account doing? You know what's really cool about that? It's not taxed. Your heavenly account is not taxed. Isn't that cool? Now the devil tries to steal it before you invest it. Think about it. So where are you richer? Are you richer here on this earth or in heaven? Where have you been spending more time and energy putting your investments? Just an interesting thought. Jesus goes on from there after exhorting us. Say, listen, hey guys. Don't be worried and store up so much treasure on this earth. Now, we're going to get into this idea of you need to realize that Jesus is not against a 401k. He's not against storing up. In fact, there's scriptures that I'm going to get to in, in a little bit here that talks about you need to store up. You need to be smart. You need to plan ahead. The problem is the perception and excess and selfishness and greed. Verse 21. Is, is the summation of that emphasis. Basically, he says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your, your, heart, your heart will be also. I mean, you can see this in a real practical new way. You just spent $30,000 for a new boat. Somebody gets near the boat, you get a little nervous. I've told you the story in the past where screwing around, riding bikes with the group. I'm not a very good group rider. I'm screwing around too much. Um, but we're all pulling into the gas station and whatever, then go get lunch. And I come whipping up there my bike and I just hit the rear brake and I was going to slide up and just get like really close. And I went, just that much too close. And I went, pop, and my bike just bumped the blinker light of uh, one of the guys on the group. And, and, and you could hear the little plastic outside blinker shell going, I didn't smash it. I didn't, you know, it just went. And he perked up. He came back there and looked at that. And he was, he was getting all fired up. And he realized it was me who did it. <laughs> and you can see the thoughts like, shoot, anybody else I could really let him have it. But one night it's <laughs> It was a really comical thing to watch. But he got all freaked. I said, hey, relax, man. I'm, and I, I was like surprised. I didn't think it was that big a deal. But then again, to me, my bike is just, they're, they're just a bike. I mean, so I bought him a whole pack of four so I could do it three more times. <laughs> just to irritate him and make a point. Hey, listen, brother, this stuff's not, it's just stuff. Don't get off. But see, his treasure, his investment, he had, that's where his heart was. I wonder why our homes are so important to us and all these because we've invested so much treasure there. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know what I have found over the years? People that make sacrifices, and let me tell you what, over the years, there's been a lot of people that have made generous sacrifices to make sure that this church was here, that these lights would stay on, and you'd have somewhere to sit. Their heart's here. Why? 
they've invested a lot here. This is home. This is what they hope to see is going to reach people and minister to people. Man, they're committed. It started with their money and their heart followed. I wonder. I wonder if we don't have a real heart for the lost because we don't give to missions. If you give to missions, you have a heart for the lost and you look for it, you pray for them. Maybe you'll even take a trip and just you're going to get involved. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I don't know, doesn't that seem like a weird statement in the midst of talking about worldly possessions? It's odd. It's almost like out of the blue. Friends, would you understand it though? It even makes more emphasis. He's saying basically this. Where your treasure is, your heart is. Don't store up treasures on, on earth, but store them in heaven. And he goes right into this idea that if your eyes are healthy, you see, you know he's making a direct correlation to? The warning to the, to the false prophets and stuff. He says, though you have eyes to see, you don't see. You have ears to hear, you don't hear. He's saying, listen, you're, if your eye is not healthy, if you can't see this, you're missing it. The investment is in the kingdom of heaven. Your life needs to be lived out for the kingdom of heaven. If your eye can, you can't see this, it's going to be full of darkness. Your eyes are healthy versus they're blind to the deceitfulness of wealth. Verse 24. Jesus teaching, our master, kind of just drives the screw home a little tighter. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Wow. The dangers of riches. The deceitfulness of wealth. He goes on. He doesn't stop there. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than body, food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap, store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? No, you can take some away though. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. And I tell you that Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of, was not dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass in the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry. Saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Listen to this. For the pagans run after these things. The pagans and the non-believers focus is there. As believers, our focus is not there. Concern for that? Is it important? We're going to get into all that. Jesus is not saying that you, you, know, you shouldn't do it and work hard and all that. But he's saying an inordinate emphasis emphasis on that area. Pagans, they run after these things. But your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. Again, foundational truth. But seek first His kingdom. You see, that's the priority. First, seek His kingdom and His righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Everybody say amen. 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 Hey, each trouble has enough to worry about today. In verse, from verses 25 through verse 34, 
He said, don't worry, six times. Don't worry. Don't worry. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 22. Jesus is once again talking about the dangers of riches. You know, friends, hopefully you and I are going to realize that by the time this Sunday's morning the service is over, hopefully you and I will have a new view of money. We won't see it as something to love. We'll see it rather like a stick of dynamite. It has very a lot of power, but you have to handle it carefully. Amen? Matthew chapter 19, beginning at verse 16. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what, must, uh, what, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Again, friends, let me just emphasize and frame this. We're talking about serious spiritual stuff here. We're talking about eternal life. Eternal life. The seed that began to grow up in the worries of this world and the deceitfulness of, of the sequence of riches choked it out. Here, the question is, what must I do to get eternal life? Jesus throws a, a lesson about money into this discussion. Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Smart Alex. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and your mother, love your neighbor yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. There, Jesus again. A little side note, treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. It's amazing. The dangers of riches, it really can become an albatross among our necks. Sell your possessions. You know, Jesus really did not need, it's kind of a hyperbole, <clears throat> who's emphasizing the truth by, <clears throat> by um, stressing and exaggerating it. Go sell everything that you have. Really, in this particular passage, Jesus is emphasizing two things. Greed and hoarding. Greed and hoarding. Greed has to do with this excessive desire. Hoarding has to do with, literally, if you look in the dictionary, it means to hide or to conceal. This idea of selfish, a self-reliant trust. Friends, God wants us to invest, start saving up, store up. I mentioned earlier, I mean, in, in Proverbs chapter 6, it says, Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways. Doesn't have a, a commander, but yet gathers in the summer, stores away for the winter. Um, it talks about how, as a parent, it's, it's not right for the children to store for their parents, but the parents to store for the children. Um, the scripture in Proverbs 21, 20 says, The wise store up choice foods and olive oil, but fools gulp them down. It's wise to store up during the years of plenty for the, the lean years. The problem is, is the emphasis. Don't do one in neglect to the other. Don't store up treasure for yourself and the pleasures of this life without being mindful of investing in the kingdom. Storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And there's where it becomes very dangerous. Dangerous stuff, this money. Luke chapter 12. Like I said this morning, we're just going to go through some of these major passages, Jesus is teaching, once again, Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 13 through 21. Some of the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. I mean, back then, that was a big deal. The oldest son got a double inheritance as opposed to the rest. And somebody must not have been being fair here. 
and this was a big deal in Eastern culture, Jesus replied, man, Jesus was a, was a Renaissance man of the 70s. Man? <laughs> Who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Jesus says, watch out. You got dynamite in your hands. Watch out. Be careful. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. Well, I tell you what, if you and I could only live with the mentality of Christmas, you know how it is. We've all felt it. You give a gift to somebody, even if it's a little child, and you just watch them come alive. Life does not consist of your possessions. In fact, at times, your life is going to be measured up and consists of what you've given away, what you've given to others. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? My business is doing well, and I should, do, I should be doing something more. I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. There I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded and who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. I, I think it's tragic what the TV evangelist has done with you and I messing with money. The stereotype that we have gotten is that, well, the preacher up there or the church, Christianity, all they want is your money. It's a tragedy. Because of that, we've kind of shied away from this reality of realizing, friends, money is a very dangerous thing. If you've been given a lot of it, you've been given a greater danger and more responsibility. You need to ask yourself questions more often. God, is this all for me? What would you like me to do? How could I help? Help me to see how transitory, how fleeting life is. We spend so much time building our own personal kingdom. And friends, it's gone. Our eternal kingdom, where we should be shipping lumber to, <laughs> storing of riches, I guess God doesn't need lumber up there. Our investments in heaven ought to be greater than our investments on earth. Again, you know, the emphasis here isn't having things. It's the contrast, he says. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. I shared with you a story. This was quite a few years ago. A uh, young man pulled up with his, his Harley... Uh, outside my window, he's he got a new bike, he's all excited, and it happens throughout the summer. People come by and, you know, Pastor Mike, I got a new bike, come out and see it. And I'm happy to go out and share their joy with them, because I'm ex genuinely excited for them. And, and I don't know why this came out of my mouth, but it just did, and it felt like a teachable moment, because I got this idea, this young man really was a Christian, but very surfacey. He wasn't committed to the church, he wasn't committed to evangelism, he wasn't committed to serving the Lord in his life. He just wanted, he was just a Christian on the outside. And I said to him, well, I said, you know, I'm really excited for you, but I hope you didn't rob God to get it. <laughs> in other words, again, you've invested everything for yourself. You've never invested anything in the kingdom. <coughs> Tragically, like the other rich guy here that Jesus talked to, he went away very sad. Riches choked it. 
tragically, we in, 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 as the church, unfortunately, I think we have we have really done people a terrible disservice. Now, not here. Hopefully, I'm irritating to you almost every week. But in some churches, seriously, without really thinking about it, they have preached and proclaimed that your highest commitment to God is to come to church on Sunday. That you get to church on Sunday and that you would tithe. If you do that, you're a great Christian. Guess what? You won't hear that from me. I expect a whole lot more out of you. Because I believe in what God does. God's highest ideal isn't for you to make church on Sunday morning. Well, I made it to church. Good evening for you. Granted, it's a good thing. But that's, that's not your commitment to God. That's your commitment to grow and to worship Him and to be with the fellowship of the, of the saints. What you do for God is what you do after you leave here. And I'm very concerned with that. Because you will give an account before God. And I'd like to think that God, when I get there, He's going to say, you know, Mike, he said you were an equal opportunity pisser offer. Good for you. <laughs> I know I can see Jesus saying that to me. Good job. In other words, you were consistent. You, you, you. It's a higher ideal, friends. Well, I'm a Christian. I go to church on Sunday. You know, big what? Boy, if you really want to make attendance grow, it's probably not the best message to have, huh? <laughs> you know something? Where your treasure is, there your heart is. You, you get involved. You want to be there. First Timothy chapter 6. We have a couple more to look at. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. Again, now this is not Jesus. This is the Apostle Paul. As he was walking with the Lord, obviously, in spiritual wisdom, as he was given guidelines and insight on how to live our life. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. He says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. You know, I think the Apostle Paul could say he has seen it happen. Friends, 34 years as a minister, I've seen it happen again and again and again. It's, it's again, it's not, the, it's not the riches, it's the, they're wanting to get rich. It, it, this idea of excess, of, of wanting and not being content. Yeah, I don't know who said it, but they said, you know, if if somebody's not content with what they have, they're probably not going to be content with what they want. If you haven't learned to just be content and thankful for all that you have, you're probably not going to be very content with the next thing you get. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation. I can think of all kinds of temptation. Maybe not be totally ethical, not to be totally moral, not to be truly honest. All kinds of temptations to fudge the books, to cheat a little here, take a little there. All kinds of temptations. Cut God out of the equation. I'm going to put postpone. I'm going to tempt it to do all kinds of things. And a trap. That's a scary word. And into many foolish and harmful desires to plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Wow. Just over a little further, verse 17, the Apostle Paul, he continues, he says, Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. Friends, there are wealthy Christians. There are Christians who have been blessed. Your business is doing well. Maybe you've inherited, maybe you've heard, I mean... The, the, the problem is not with being blessed. The problem is not with 
having riches is be very careful, those of you who do, because you have a higher responsibility. Oh, by the way, just a real quick newsflash. You live in America, you're all very wealthy. Yeah. It's easy to look around and to look at, well, that guy's got more of that. Because you, we're all very wealthy. Command those who are rich in this world not to put, be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their, their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Again, for our enjoyment. Not just life. He wants us to play. It, it's all in perspective. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous, willing to share. In this way, they will lay up for treasures for themselves. There's that concept again. Storing up treasures in heaven. As a firm foundation for the coming age. So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Hebrews chapter, chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. God bless you. Verses 5 and 6. Keep your lives free from the love of money. And be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Wow, isn't that just tremendously encouraging? We're going to get into, in a couple weeks, this idea that, all this idea when he says, don't worry about money, he does, he's not giving you a license to be lazy. Well, I'm just not going to worry. God's going to provide. No, he's going to provide you the ability to go out and get gain. But we're going to talk about that next, we're going to talk about that next week. To truly understand our source. Your source, our source. If you hear, you think you're pretty sharp. You think you're pretty talented. You know, if other people just work as hard as you, they make more money. We're going to address that. Sound like fun? Yep. Cool? Yep. I love you. Love you too. Love you too, man. Today's been an odd day in, in some ways. Just because it's not my normal, you know. But it's okay. It's good. Okay? If you didn't like it, it's Mike at Real Church. <laughs> not Gord. No, I do love you. Hey, this Saturday is a Stephanie's uh, party. Uh, man, $10. It's going to be a great time. Um, all kinds of uh, fundraising things, uh, four-wheeler, and all kinds. It's just going to be a fun time for family. So I just want to encourage you to come out and support the handsome family. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, dismiss us from this place. Help us in this coming series for you to search our hearts and help us to understand the dangers of money. Father, dismiss us now in your presence, we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.